بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم رب اشرح لي صدري ويسر لي أمري وحل عقدة من لساني يلقاه قولي يا رب بالمصطفى بلغ مقاصدنا واغفر لنا ما مضى يا واسع الكرم الحمد لله وبريز بيت والله سبحانه وتعالى We gave us the ability to remember the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and we praise him and we thank him for this ni'mah and we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that he allows us to always be in a state of remembrance of his beloved sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and that he continues to ennoble us with the sharaf of being of those connected with the circles of knowledge and the circles of remembrance and the gathering in the house of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala this type of gathering in this day and age is one of the greatest blessings of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala we all know the difficulties that we are going through in this day and age and the hardships that this world is going through as a, as a general community not only the human beings but the whole earth itself and so these are circles of paradise upon earth and these are blessings from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that we take protection in and we take guidance in and so the name of the Prophet Sayyiduna Nasihun Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam refers to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam's manifestation of good counsel towards those around him. When we look at the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, his character, his personality, the foundation of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is Rahmah. Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala describes the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam as وَمَا أَرْسَلْنَاكَ إِلَّا رَحْمَةً لِلْعَالَمِينَ That we did not send you except as a mercy to the universe. And so anything that comes forth from the Prophet ﷺ, whether it's his words, whether it's his actions, whether it's his admonitions, whether it's his counsel, comes forth from the root and the source of mercy. And this is the first lesson that we take from the Prophet ﷺ in our role as uh, givers of advice. Is that the essence of that advice, first and foremost, should be mercy. That the essence of that advice shouldn't be anger. The essence of that advice shouldn't be belittlement. The essence of, of that advice shouldn't be arrogance. Where we try and show ourselves as being greater than the one that we are giving advice to. And so the Prophet ﷺ, whenever he gave advice, the intention of the Prophet ﷺ, amongst the intentions, is that the Prophet ﷺ wanted to correct that person's relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's the intention. And so everything that you see that comes forth from the Prophet ﷺ is now channeled towards that aim and mission. It's not just superficial talk. It's not just something that the Prophet ﷺ is there to fulfill a responsibility and off I go, that's, I've done my bit. But the Prophet ﷺ really here in this individual that he is giving advice to, he wants to change their state to a better state than they are in before he gave them the advice that he is about to give them. And this is the first step. That the, 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 the effect that we have on those that we give counsel to will depend upon our inner state first and foremost. And so, the Prophet ﷺ, after we look at the inner state of the Prophet ﷺ, the outer manifestation of that is that the Prophet ﷺ used to lead by example. You know, if you want to give counsel to somebody, the best way to give them counsel is to model it to them without having to even say anything in the first place. So they see you, and they look at you, and they reflect by looking at you because the believer is a mirror of the believer. When they look at you, they see in you what they want to see in themselves. And that's what the Prophet ﷺ gave to us. That he gives us, whenever we look at the Prophet ﷺ, whenever we see him, we see, I want to be like that. I want to speak like him, talk like him, dress like him. We want to conduct ourselves and have character like him, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And the way that begins is by ourselves first. And so the first port of call in this nasiha that we see in the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa is his inner reality. And when we look at this purpose of da'wah, or giving counsel, the essence of it, if we look at knowledge first and foremost, the essence of knowledge is himma, is motivation, is drive, it's persistence. That's the source and the driving force be behind acquiring knowledge. And I'm mentioning that to you because you're students of knowledge. And then the, the guiding principle or the force, the driving force behind 
giving advice to others and calling them towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is ham. It's that uh, concern. It's the best way I can describe, uh, explain it in, Arab, uh, in English. It's concern. So the reason why you're giving uh, advice to somebody is out of genuine concern for them. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala many a times in the Quran mentions to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam that you are about to, uh, you're, you're pushing yourself to the limit in order to guide these people to Islam. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa used to go way out of his way sallallahu alayhi wa sallam to, to give good counsel to people, to give advice to them, even to his enemies sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, right till the end. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa never gave up on the likes of Abu Jahl, Abu Lahab. He gave them chance after chance after chance. He gave them advice after advice. And the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam gave them opportunity after opportunity. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam had this hum, this concern. As we see in the janazah of the Jewish person that passes the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he stands. And the Sahaba say what? They say, Ya Rasulullah, he's a Jew. And the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says, It is a soul that has passed me by into the hellfire. Was his concern? This is a person that I have. He's, he's gone into the hellfire. Maybe I could have done something else for him. You see that concern of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, connected with mercy, and so the intent, the driving force is concern. The method, is that yeah. the method is, yeah, the method is mercy. The package in which the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam delivers this is mercy. He does it in a merciful way. And so when we look at some examples of this and we see the Prophet ﷺ, we see examples of the Prophet ﷺ advising those who were committing sin or about to commit sin. We see the Prophet ﷺ advising those who were doing good but they could do better. We see the Prophet ﷺ advising those who were doing too much and they were overlooking the rights of others in that excessive state of worship that they were in. And so when we look at the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, one of the habits of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is he would praise before he would advise. Because when you're about to advise somebody, what they're going to say to you is, is that what you could see? You didn't see all the good? Yeah, the brothers that are married know what I'm talking about. Yeah. Is that what you could see? You always, that's, you only see the negative. You don't see any of the good that I do. And the sisters. Who were married. Yeah. So the Prophet وسلم, first would say what he would focus on the good first. So we look at Sayyidina Abdullah ibn Umar radiallahu an, for example, that great Sahabi, that the Prophet وسلم, once advises and counsels him, and this is an example of somebody doing good but they could do better. And you see the Prophet وسلم, pushing his students here. Look, you can see somebody has a potential to do more, and this is where we should be as students with our teachers. When they tell you something, Grasp on to it and manifest it. Manifest what they want from you and they advise you to do. So the Prophet ﷺ says, Abdullah ibn Umar, you're a good man if only you worshipped more in the night. So after the saying of the Prophet ﷺ, this is Abdullah ibn Umar, with all of the, the, the good attributes and qualities that he had, and that's why the Prophet ﷺ praised him, that one of the things that he was he needed to develop him was to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala more in the night. After the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa said this, they say Sayyidina Abdullah ibn Umar's state transformed. And now at night he would hardly ever sleep. So here you see the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa seeing somebody doing good, but he can see a greater potential in them. And this is again something that we can see within our children. When we're advising them, through the method here we see of mercy, we see of love, of genuine concern. It's not belittlement, it's not embarrassment, it's not uh, trying to expose them, but it's trying to bring something out in them which they will see the fruits of in the hereafter. And likewise we see with Sayyidina Mu'adh ibn Jabal, radiyallahu an, the great Sahabi from, of Yemen. And the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa said, Ya Mu'adh, inni uhibbuk. How amazing. He says, Ya Mu'adh, I love you. That's how he begins. Look at the, the look at the presentation of this counsel that he gives. Let's just reflect on ourselves. Why is this out of its place? Why do you mean you do your homework? How many times do I have to tell you? The kids are smiling. Huh? They can hear their fathers and mothers in my voice. Huh? 
How many times? Huh? This is, look at the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Oh Mu'adh, I love you. Now when you grasp somebody and you t grasp their attention through love, now they're in your hands, you can do with them whatever you wish. Yeah. They love you and they've heard your expression of love for them. The Prophet said, I love you, and so do, so do not leave saying, Allahumma ilni ala dhikrika wa shukrika wa husni ibadah, take after every salah. Look at the way the Prophet is advising That look, the, 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 the foundation of, a, of my advice to you is because of my love for you. I'm not telling you to do this to burden you with even more. I'm not doing this to trouble you. I'm not doing this to criticize you or say that you're not doing enough. But I'm doing this because I absolutely love you and out of love for you, I'm giving you this advice. Now imagine how that person receives that advice now. And we see with all of the Sahaba Al-Kiram that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam advises, they're transformed. We see one of the young Sahaba and uh, this Sahabi says they were on a trouble with the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and his tent was next to the tent of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. How blessed, how fortunate. And he says, when I came out of my tent one day, one of the days that I came out, I saw some women outside. And so he said, I quickly went back into my tent and I dressed in my best clothes and I came back out again, sitting around these women. Yeah? Just at that point, the Prophet ﷺ comes out of this tent. Uh oh. It's all over. He's caught me. Yeah. Now, my Urdu or Punjabi or Mirpuri isn't very good. But just imagine if your parents saw you in that state, what kind of words that would come out of their mouth? Or what kind of objects would come flying at your head? Yeah. The Prophet ﷺ says to him, What are you doing here? He says, uh, He was taken aback. And he says, um, Ya Rasulullah, I've got a camel. And this camel always runs away, so I'm just uh, keeping a lookout on my camel. You know, you know what it's like, Ya Rasulullah, these camels nowadays. Prophet <laughs> yeah. said, Okay. He says, After that, we were on a journey back to Madinah al Munawwara. And every time the Prophet saw me, he would say to me, How's your camel doing? He said, I was so shy. He goes, I was embarrassed because every time you would see me, you'd ask me about my camel now. And he says, now we were swift. He goes, I was swift in my way back to Medina. I wanted to get to Medina as soon as possible so I could get home and the Prophet, I would get away from the Prophet. I was embarrassed, I was shy. He says, when I got to Medina, to Munawwara, he said, I stopped. You're distracting me now. There's all these sweets. Allah, mashallah. Yeah. I should be giving you sweets. And so, he says, now out of embarrassment, I stayed away from Masjid and Nabawi al Sharif. Look at this. And there's two points of, although we're reflecting in this, focusing mainly on the method of counseling of the Prophet, also reflect on this, on the effect of committing sin. And that when we do commit sin, when we do create an imbalance within ourselves and we oppress ourselves, the, 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 the side effect of that is that we are made mahroom from good deeds. Allah bars us, shuns us away from good deeds now. So this is why we should stay away from committing sins because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when we soil ourselves and make ourselves impure, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala keeps us away from those things which are beloved to Him and pure. He says, eventually I came to the masjid of the Prophet He said, I couldn't keep myself any longer. They said, I went at a time when it was least busy. Hardly anybody there was waiting. He says, I went in, I started to pray. He says, whilst I'm praying, I notice that the Prophet ﷺ comes out of his hujra al-sharif. He comes out of his blessed chamber. And his, masjid, his house was connected to the masjid. He says, I continue to elongate my salah. It made my salah really long. I'm just carrying on and carrying on and carrying on, waiting. Hopefully, I'll make the Prophet ﷺ will have something else to do and he'll get tired and he'll leave. And the Prophet ﷺ was sat there and he said, Elongate your salah as long as you wish, I'm waiting for you. <laughs> so he said, Now I felt embarrassed. And I said to myself, I'm going to present myself to the Prophet. 
how long can I keep myself away from doing this? And so he said, I finished my salah and I went to the Prophet and the Prophet said to me, how's your camel? And he said to the Prophet Ya Rasulullah, ever since I became a Muslim, I've never lost my camel. And the Prophet placed his blessed hand on my chest and he said three times, May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala have mercy upon you. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala have mercy on you. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala have mercy on you. Look at the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He didn't admonish him. The best form of counsel is when you make the patient reflect on, upon themselves and go through a process of self-reflection and self-correction. That's the best form of reformation. You can say to somebody and you can shout to them, you can admonish them and you can talk down. To, you can give them the best of advice. Yeah. But if you do not tap into their inner conscience and make them want to change, most of those of your words will fall upon deaf ears. So we see the Prophet ﷺ here tapping into the very essence of the conscience of the Sahaba al-Kiram so that they went and reflected upon themselves. Similar, you will have heard the narration. The young youth, first of all, look at the Sahaba and look at the nature of the Prophet ﷺ that Sahaba were able to come and speak to him about anything. Absolutely anything. Matters of marriage. Women would come to him and ask him about matters that some would be embarrassed about. They would ask him about intimacy. They would ask him about enmity. They would ask him about the states of their heart of greed and anger that they were facing. They would talk about matters of their home. Because they knew the Prophet ﷺ wouldn't go and announce it on the mimbar. He wouldn't laugh at them. He wouldn't belittle them. He, they knew that the Prophet ﷺ would be by their side until he was able to fix that problem that they were going through. He wouldn't let go of them. And so you, one of the youth from the Sahaba, he comes to the Prophet ﷺ, he says, Ya Rasulullah, I'm going to make zina. Now just think of the relationship the Prophet ﷺ must have had with the youth for them to have the audacity, we would call it, to actually go to the Prophet ﷺ and say, I'm about to commit zina. Now we wouldn't say that to our parents, you would say that to the local imam, or the mufti, or the shaykh. This is the, me the final messenger وسلم, the one upon whom the Qur'an is being revealed. And look at the method of the Prophet, again, self-reflection. He doesn't shout at him, doesn't belittle him. The Prophet ﷺ makes him reflect upon himself and taps into his conscience. He said, would you wish that somebody did that with your mother or your sister or your daughter? That's it. And he flipped this individual from coming as a person intending to commit sin, as a person who goes away and he has made tawbah from this intention. Prophet ﷺ made him reflect. Because most of the sins that people commit are committed in a state of their nafs having overcome them. It's called the hawa. The same word for wind. You know the wind that <coughs> takes you this way one moment, takes you another way another moment. That's what the hawa does, your desires. They make you do things which are unbefitting. You know, if you were to stop at that moment and you were to use your rational mind, you would say, Am I crazy? How on earth could I even think of doing this? I know what the consequences are. But at that moment, we're overcome by our shahawat and our desires and we make silly mistakes. But the Prophet ﷺ here uses the intellect as a means of controlling the limbs. And here Imam Ghazali in his Ihya al Mudin talks about this much. Yeah, about how the different faculties overcome one another. There's an internal battle that takes place. And what should happen is that the limbs are subject to the intellect. Not that they dictate to you what they want to do and you obey them, but in fact they fall in line with what you know is best in their interest. In terms of food, in terms of drink, for example. It's not that when the stomach demands, you give it whatever it wants, whenever it wants. Because if you did that, you would end up killing yourself within a very short period of time, out of obesity. In fact, one of the statistics, I'm going off on a tangent, is that more people are dying because of health-related issues linked to eating than out of starvation. You know, in the past, people used to die because of starvation. We've got more people dying now because of eating rather than not eating. And so, 
the Prophet ﷺ, when people would come to him, one of the other aspects that you would see in him is that he would not expect perfection from them. As the Prophet ﷺ says, Ya Ibn Adam, Kullukum Muthnibun, Khatta'un, Wa Khayrul Khatta'in, Attaibun. He says, O oh, sons of Adam, every single one of you are sinners. Khatta'un, yeah. the form that the Prophet ﷺ uses here is a person who commits sin after sin after sin. Not just one sin, not a one off, not a slip. This is a habit. And he says, the best of those who commit sins are those who seek forgiveness. Yeah. So the Prophet ﷺ, when people were coming to him for counsel, the first thing, he wasn't expecting them to be angels. You should know better. How dare you? How come you did this? You're a Muslim. You've got the Quran. You've got the Prophet ﷺ. You go to the masjid. You've got a beard. You wear a hijab. Your father's a sheikh. None of that. The very first expectation from the Prophet ﷺ is that yes, we're, we're, we're humans and you are not prophets. Only the prophets are free from sin. We expect that we have faults and difficulties and deficiency in ourselves. And so when we're taking from this name of the Prophet ﷺ, Sayyidina Nasihun ﷺ, we need to take that into consideration. Especially in this day and age of imbalance. You know, the day and age that we are living in, human beings have never eaten how they have eaten before. They've never drank the way that humans drink before. They've never worked like human beings have worked before. Humans have never worked the way that we work. They've never done that. They've never had the types of relationships that we have had in terms of the amount of time that we give to one another, the amount of attention that we give to one another. The amount of distractions or entertainment that we have, human beings have never entertained themselves in the way that we are entertaining ourselves today. And so we need to expect an imbalance. We need to expect flaws, deficiencies and sins. It's going to happen. If we create an imbalance in the water, the rivers, the seas, the oceans, we see its effect on human beings, don't we? Or if we have an imbalance in the air with pollution or in the soil, it affects human beings, it comes back to bite us. And so likewise, in the way that we are now leading our lives and we are dealing with one another, the pollution, the corruption, or the, 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 the moving away from the prophetic way that has happened in this day and age, you know, we're rewriting more or less everything. Rules and laws and priorities, genders, we're rewriting relationships, we're rewriting, you know, we want to go back to the drawing board and we want to rewrite everything. It's going to, we are going to create in this day and age disturbed individuals. It's the nature of this day and age. What the Muslim community needs to be is that bastion of right guidance and good counsel to people. We need to be those people who anybody can turn to. Anybody. No matter what kind of gender they are, no matter what kind of orientation they have, no matter what sin they have committed, no matter what religion they are from, no matter what culture they are from, no matter what background they have, what dress they wear, does not matter to a Muslim. And there's a, an organization in America called Ta'leef. Our beloved brother Osama Kanan, please make dua for him, inshallah. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mercy. He's going through a terminal illness. But he set that up with the likes of Mustafa Davis and those brothers. They have a beautiful strap line. And their strap line, their slogan is, Come as you are to Islam as it is. You come as you are, no expectations. We're not going to have a clipboard at the front. How long? You know, we're not going to have a measuring tape to measure your beard. Is it a fistful length or not? We're not going to come and check your hijab. You know, how many strands of hair have come out of your hijab? You know, sorry, you can't come in, sister. You know, there's no expectations. Ripped jeans, clothes, well, however they are, piercings, tattoos. You, know, you come as you are. But when you come, we will give you Islam as it is. We will give you Islam as it was given to us by the Prophet Muhammad That beautiful, merciful religion that wants nothing but good for everybody and everything in the creation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And when we look at the Prophet with his nasiha, for example, he begins at home first. We hear from the narration after the blessed marriage of Sayyidina Fatima Al-Zahra Al-Batul Al-Zahida Fildatu Kibadi Rasulillahi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam The one whom 
was called, the Prophet ﷺ said, she is a piece of my liver, the seat of emotion. That's how he described her. And Sayyidina Ali Karramallahu Wajhahul Kareem, that great youth who supported the Prophet ﷺ. When they got married for six months afterwards, the Prophet ﷺ would go past their house and he would say, Ya Salah, Ya Ahl al Bayt. The prayer, O oh my family. He would continue to guide them and give them nasihah, give them encouragement towards salah. The Prophet ﷺ was in a state of balance. He wasn't lax in the fact that anything and everything went and then you can do whatever you want, you know, it's all cool, you know, let's just light up a spliff and, you know, it's all good. Let's just, you know, let's just have some cannabis and, it's, you know, it's all good, don't worry about it, it's fine. No, no, the Prophet ﷺ was, wasn't like that. He knew the boundaries and he told people their boundaries. He told them with mercy though and, and rahmah and concern. And, like, and also the Prophet ﷺ wasn't harsh. He was in, in, in a state of balance. As Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, وَلَوْ كُنْتَ فَضَّمْ غَلِيذَ الْقَلْبِ لَنْ فَضُّ مِنْ حَوْلِكَ That if you were harsh-hearted, then people would have fled away from you, Ya Rasulullah. In other words, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is teaching us a lesson here. That the only reason why people came to Islam in the time of Jahiliyyah, and this is going to be a bold statement, wasn't because of the Quran. Wasn't because of his miracles. But it was because of the gentleness and the mercy and the good character of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Allah is saying that in the Quran. That if you were harsh-hearted, in other words, the secret to the spread of Islam is the condition of your heart, Ya Rasulullah. It was his blessed heart that if we trace back, brings the, you, the likes of you and I to Islam today. It's because of that blessed heart, may Allah's peace of blessings be upon him, that guided us today. A final example of somebody who is in a state of excess in worship. The Prophet ﷺ said that uh, Abdullah ibn Amr ibn al-As radiallahu anhu that he was an individual who would fast every single day and he would complete the Qur'an every single night. SubhanAllah. Now how does he get caught when he gets married? His father comes to check on his daughter-in-law. Yes, you've heard me correctly. Yeah? The father-in-law or his father comes to check up on his daughter-in-law. Not to check up is she washing his clothes properly and feeding him properly, cleaning the house well. He comes to check to see whether his son is treating her well or not. How beautiful is that? How amazing is Medina Tul Munawwara? Look at, the, look at what the Prophet ﷺ produces. Not people who are looking out for their self-interests, but they're making sure that the rights of those who have a right over them are being fulfilled. So he asks her, how is my son? She says he's, a, he's wonderful. He fasts all day and he worships all night. Yeah. Now some would see that, you know, some would say, what she meant is he leaves me alone, I can do whatever I want. MashaAllah, it's a blessing. If only my husband was like that, left me alone. Yeah. It's a blessing, Stay out, stays out of my way. But she didn't mean that. She was grateful, Alhamdulillah, he's worshipping Allah. What can I complain about? Father gets upset. And he says, what have you done to this woman? And he goes to complain to the Prophet ﷺ of what? Not that he drinks alcohol. Not that he's not praying salah. Not that he's physically abusing his wife, a'udhu billah. Not that he's not looking after the children, no. Ya Rasulullah, I'm coming to complain to you because my son worships all night and he fasts all day. Please advise him. He calls him. And he says that... I fast and I have days in which I do not fast. And I spend time in the night worshipping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and also spending time with my family. And he says to him, if you are to fast, then fast for three days in every month. Look what he says. He says, Ya Rasulullah, but I'm able to do more than that. Yep. And this is another thing. When your teachers give you advice, take it, don't ask for more. He then, the Prophet ﷺ says to him, complete the Qur'an once a month. He says, 
says, Ya Rasulullah, I can do more than that. He says, every seven days then. Sorry, about the fasting, the Prophet ﷺ says to him, if you must then fast the, the fast of Sayyidina Dawood ﷺ. He used to fast a day and, and not fast a day. Every other day he used to fast. And the Prophet ﷺ ends his nasiha to him by saying, it may be that you live a long age and you may not be able to maintain this. Later on when he becomes older, he says, if only I had taken the initial advice of the Prophet ﷺ. If only I stuck to that three days a month and finishing the Qur'an once a month. If only I had done that. He still maintained the, the agreement that he had. Even into his old age, he never stopped. Because he took that from the Prophet ﷺ. There was a seriousness with the advice of the Prophet ﷺ. But here again, you see the Prophet ﷺ creating a sense of, of balance. That a person shouldn't be excess in their worship, neglecting the creation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Prophet doesn't want that from us. He doesn't want us to be in a state of excess. He wants us to be in a state of balance. And so when we, whenever we look at this nature of the Prophet as an advisor, this is a role, inshallah, that we should play as well. That we see our fellow brothers and sisters in difficult states. Give them genuine advice. Give them advice out of concern. Think of ways that you can make them self-reflect and self-correct and self-heal. Be there as a support for them no matter how they are. Don't give up on them. Don't say, I advise you today, you haven't changed by tomorrow, so that's it. <coughs> I'm, you know, I've had enough of you. I've done my bit and that's it. No, it takes time for change to happen. It doesn't happen overnight. So we stick by our brothers and sisters. We give them good counsel. We role model that good advice that we want to see in them, in ourselves first, so that we can show them. And then through that state, through those sta stages, with sincere intention, also the last thing I forgot, which is the most important dua. Yeah. Dua is immense. Before you give counsel to somebody and after you give counsel to somebody, make dua for them. As the Prophet ﷺ, he makes dua for who? Abu Jahl and Sayyidina Umar radiallahu anhu. They're not even Muslims yet. And look at the words of the Prophet ﷺ. He says, O oh Allah, make whoever is most beloved to you strengthen Islam through them. Look at this. They're in a state of kufr. They're in a state of kufr and the, and the Prophet ﷺ is saying, guide the one who is most beloved to you. How can he be beloved and he's a kafir? One may say. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is not restricted by time. When we look at a person as a kafir, we're looking at them in a particular point in life. We don't know their true reality. Their true reality is based on what Allah knows about them. And it may be that this person is a kafir now, he'll be a believer tomorrow. So whenever we look at anybody, no matter what they are, don't look at them from your or my limited, narrow-minded perspective. But look at them from the perspective that this could be a person beloved to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And with that rahmah, with that concern, with that understanding that this person could be the, the beloved of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, let them come forth your advice to them. And then see the transformation within them inshallah. Make dua for them. And model good behavior to them. And be consistent in your uh, advice to them. And always... Be, be a person who is there for their support, inshallah. And we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that He manifests this beloved characteristic of the Prophet وسلم, as a counselor and an advisor and uh, a person who had concern for others within us, Ya Rabbil Alameen. And Ya Allah, we ask you that you rectify our states and the states of our families and our loved ones, Ya Rabbil Alameen, and our communities. And Ya Allah, we ask you by the sake of the Prophet وسلم, that you bring our hearts in line with the character of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and that you overlook our faults, Ya Rabbil Alameen and that by him sallallahu alayhi wa sallam you allow us to enter into paradise wa sallallahu ala Sayyidina Muhammadin wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam wa ala'afu minkum